My father started the uh, canoe journey with Ralph Monroe, and that was for the centennial of uh, the state of Washington. And uh, he just recently passed away, he was 102, and he was my inspiration. He's a risk taker, he pushed me to the limits. And he came up with the idea of doing canoes, having revitalized some canoe carving uh, for the centennial where they would uh, come in and, and uh, land, land at the chill show. And I, you know, I would have put a dollar on that. I, I said, Dad, it's not gonna happen. And I have to speak for myself because I'm native and I know natives. It's like pulling teeth on some projects. It says it's not going to happen. But he was with the, he's a superintendent of public instruction with Johnson O'Malley. So he knew all the native uh, tri uh, chairmen and he, he knew how to relate to, and he was raised that way with native peoples. And he says, Well, Marvin, I, this is a project I, I plan on. Pursuing and uh, so where are the logs coming from? He says, well, they're going to come. He went to D.C. and there's a small little cultural clause that says they can uh, you get wood, you get cedar logs out of, on on federal land for cultural purposes. And so I go, wow, you know, I didn't know that. So they, he got all the loggers that were in that area, but Darrington, they went the natives that chose to have a canoe made went up to Darrington and they picked out these incredibly large canoes. We also got uh, victors from the same area that we got the, the canoes from up at Darrington. And uh, so then that is now what he gets, they cut him down and Ralph Monroe, Secretary of State, he got the uh, National Guard to have low boys to uh, load those logs up and take them to each tribe that requested those uh, those logs. They had a they had a ceremony there. That, well, once the when they were cutting the trees, and then you had Bill Holm and uh, Steve Brown and uh, Ray Pascal and others that knew about canoe carving, assist in teaching how to carve these 36 foot wooden canoes. It was amazing, you know. I'm, going, I'm still scratching my head, Dad. I don't, you know, this is it gonna happen? And anyway, the, the, the long story short. The canoes are carved, and then when they had the centennial, there was, uh, the, and then Canada came down, there was 13, I think there was 13 canoes showed up at Show Show. Big salmon bait, it was amazing. And uh, <coughs> that started the canoe journeys that you see and you hear about each and every year. In each village, Tulalip, and I don't know who's launching it this uh, month, or two, I think it is this year. And they host these incredible invitations of those canoe journeys at uh, Canada now is and uh, they come from New Zealand and Japan and Hawaii to participate in the canoe journey and it brings the extended families together you know for for not the purpose of funerals or this and that and blah 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 but it's those families that come together that never really see themselves but they put them in a the canoe they become one and uh, so that was really a, a vision he had, and then the, the tribes caught on to this idea. They said, let's host the next one. And my dad, before he passed away, he said, you know, Dad, Marvin, I want to see 100 canoes someday. I said, man, 100 canoes, it's a lot of canoes. And Sax, uh, Squawks and Island, Ralph Monroe, they hosted uh, one, it's been a number of years ago, and 104 canoes showed up. That made his day. So I took upon myself to reinvent the canoe where I could take out people like yourself in Alaska in carbon fiber 36 foot canoes. So Dwayne carved this exact replica, the one that's in the bird. We had it scanned, and we went, this is all high tech. Molds were made, and then it had, we made the molds for the canoes, and now we lay the carbon fiber inside the canoes, pop the canoes out. And then they're all, I took it to Elliott Bay Marine Architects and Engineers, they did all the flotation tests on them, which I knew I had to do if I was going to take out paid passengers. And then I took it to the U.S. Coast Guard Marine Inspector. He looked at all this information. I took a canoe up to Ketchikan for him to have him inspect it, and he looked at all this material. He said, I don't need to see the canoe. You've done your homework. 
we, you are now a commercial vessel. <laughs> so we got license to take out and pay passengers on the catcher. So I built five of them. We're going to build five more. But this, the reason I'm telling you this is because Peter's here. And, I, and Peter with the whole board. And I'm really close to Frank. I don't know if you know Bigger, but Frank, and we're really close to Frank. He's like family. But I went to that meeting with the, about the, a few months ago about the, about the port and visitors uh, bringing, bring, our visitors come here for, uh, you know, to head, head up to the cruise ships. But we want to launch them in, in Lake Union and work with you guys about bringing those people and launch and take them out like you can go out to the marsh and so on and that stuff. But go back to the canoes, it's because of my father and this is why I'm here today. And and Victor. And the, the, the thing about the pole, the, this is Victor's pole, it's not my pole. I designed it, carved it with, uh, with the help of Jim Victor and other artists. But he commissioned me to do it, it belongs to him. It's the Victor Steinbeck pole. Says by Marvin Albert, but we got to make sure who pole this pole belongs to, and that's a tradition. And I'm showing you these poles here. We have, a, and I want to give you a little overview on total poles. This is it, these poles are from Skadan, and these are a variety of different poles. And this one here, these are mortuary poles. Here, where the remains of the chief may be in here. These are house posts. I mean, uh, entry poles. So you enter the house through the entry pole. This one may not, here's the, here's the door here, but this one here is a crest pole that can be attached next to the, the house or over nearby. And maybe this one over here. But we have, we have entry poles, we have crest poles, mortuary poles, and, next slide. And, Interior poles. This is Club One, one of the most famous houses uh, in existence. Is this is uh, uh, the Club One, which has been restored. It's incredible. But these poles here, there's these are house posts. There's two types of house posts. There's house posts that actually hold the purlons, and there's also house posts that wrap around the post. And the reason for that is if the house is going to be moved. You gotta remember, cedar's not, cedar comes from the far south, from Canada, they have to, they float that up, or the pole, poles are actually carved south, and then shipped up north, because there's no cedars this big enough that could carve an elaborated pole like this. So <coughs> these are imported uh, art objects. And and so they would do, you know, the, the ones that are uh, false, we call them false house posts, so that we can take them with us. You're not going to if you move the house, mm -hmm. something's going to house. You can take those poles with you, and that's another reason. Yeah, next slide. Where's that house at? This is Cluck Wan. Where? That Cluck Wan. Southeast that's Alaska. Southeast Alaska, but Juneau. Here's our uh, pole that we always often wonder, and this is the Pike Market pole. And you can imagine that was, and I can't tell you the day when they first installed the the Pike Market Where pole. Uh, Pioneer Square. I mean, I'm sorry, Pioneer Square. The infamous Pioneer Square. The infamous, the infamous Pioneer yeah. Square. And uh, next slide. Oops, we missed one. Let's go. That's out of content. There they are. There you go. Here's the uh, other Pioneer, or oh, that's the same pole. And then we have, and that's, and this is another pole. This is. A pole. I, when I first started carving, I carved this pole here. These two with Blaine Pasco. He was commissioned to carve the poles. I believe this is for the U.S. Embassy at the World's Fair in, in Spokane, 1974. And so then, after they belonged to Dick White, uh, and Dick White uh, gave them to the city, and now they're down at the, the Pioneer. But these are these are old. You notice that they change, the colors have changed. A lot of uh, uh, this is typical of a pole that, that starts to change colors and so on. Uh, but this this pole was where I started carving those over on Bainbridge Island with, with Dwayne, and I learned a lot from him. Next slide. This is a welcome figure, and these you know, totem poles uh, are, are really associated, not here, but up 
above Vancouver, northward, and, and they're typically crest poles. There's a difference between the Salish here, you understand, and up north. The, the poles that you see that are carved with the raven, eagle, bear, blah, 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 belong to certain family crests, and they tell stories. So basically, many of those poles, and I can't tell you the that story, but there's just different stories that are, that are attached to particular families, and there may be more than one family attached to that pole. And that's where you see the elaborate carvings of different imagery. Down south, with the Nootka and the Salish, you'll have, often have, we don't have totem poles, because we, the, the, we don't have crests like they do in the, the most important thing in Alaska is not the village, it's the house. The village is made up of several different houses. Could be the Raven House, the Eagle House. That's why there's such a, that was the problem with uh, when, uh, you know him, and he went up to try to pillage the Clark Juan house. Well, the other ho the other uh, houses didn't get involved because it wasn't their business to get involved in that house. And after a while, they did finally come together and help support the Clark Juan house to say, "No, you can't, you can't take it, you can't steal it." And that's why they rented it, and now it's it's there. Down south, you have the welcome figures, and see the welcome figures are with the Salish, Coast Salish, and down is that they're welcoming you, you to their village. And this is a common figure that you may see as the canoes arrive, the welcome figures are out, and then the songs are, are sung, welcoming them to their village. Next slide. This is a poll I did uh, for Japan. And this was uh, obviously after doing the working with Dwayne's and, and Victor's poll, but this was a, a this, you can see the size of these logs. They're massive. They're this big. This is a poll I did for Tokushima, Japan. The kids just saw it not, not long ago for, for a Toyota company, a Toyota. And this is out at Daybreak Star. So we, Bernie was there, and so we we set it up to take pictures. We've done that a lot down up at Daybreak Star. But this has, there's the whale with the blowhole, the raven, and I like, instead of having a typical pool, I wanted to wrap the, I wanted the asymmetry. A lot of them don't have that. So this is kind of my style. So I wrap the raven down and picks up the sun. These are little frogs, the big bear. And this is the raven in the box of daylight, and his wings wrap around, and he has the little face of the boy. I don't know, these are frogs here. Next slide. And this is kind of a close up. I, I carve a really a lot different than all the other traditional carvers. Because I can't add, I'm not, I couldn't, I couldn't add it's very well. And I go, forget the ads. So I would sand it, so that's why you see it. It's all sanded. So I couldn't, and it's really elaborate. You can't imagine trying to add that. Dwayne could, I guess, but I wanted to really smooth it because that's the only approach I had, these little frogs and so on. Next slide. And now this is the same pole. And this is there's Sammy. And so you see the distress you see in the pole through now how many years is it? How many years? 25. 25 years. And it depends on next slide. Oh, we missed one. Let's see, do it again. There it is. So here's here's the pole. And it's really naturally uh, it's really got a really nice feeling, uh, patinaed with the grays. And let me explain to you that the poles are polished. Up north, you carve, I'm carving it in the honor of my dad or something like that. So I'm a raven. So I have to commission that to an eagle. An eagle should carve my pole for me. Then I would, and then I have to potlatch the pole. And potlatching, all it means is validation. I'm going to validate this poll, meaning that you're there to witness this event. We're going to raise the poll, and you get paid for that. So I have to pay each and every visitor a token, or if you're a chief, it, the, the value of that particular event, pretending that chief, that's how much wealth that that chief would receive. And it could be a heck of a lot. So it takes years to prepare for a potlatch, 
if it was a pole marriage and they would erect the pole. Now, once the pole is erected and the story is told, told, it's only told once and then it's paid for and then it's good and then it goes back to Mother Earth. Meaning, you wonder why they would let these poles decay. Well, that's part of the, that's, that's the part of the event. They see it go back and say, you want to see it, don't take care of the tone poles. And they, you look at those old poles, at the Charlottes and so on. They've always, they will, they've served their purpose. See, that's why you see those. And that, you know, they would try to come, and, and, but they still belong to those families. And so, the year, the, you know, the traders would come up and steal them, cut them, you know, cut the bases off and float them back down to Seattle and ship them off. They're still their poles, you know, they're still doing their thing. People don't realize that, they take it for granted. But so that they enjoyed seeing this one go to go to this good color and, and this dress. Yes, next slide. And then this this is the pole, this is really a, this is a pole I did for the National Museum for Wildlife Art. And I'll show you how I started. If you go back. Which one? Go go the back. Sketch. There they're drawing the sketch. This is the sketch I did. And I, I the poles I've done, I, you know, you, you do a drawing, I don't intend to get so elaborate, but I do. And, I, and so I sketch the pull out, I open it up, see, so you can see this is this edge and there's your left edge. So you widen and there's the pole right here. The little frogs, these, and I carved this specifically for the National Museum for Wildlife Art in Jackson, Jackson Hole, which those natives use sage for appearing ceremonies, and there's the, the Grand Tetons mountains coming up and put stars up here. And here's the raven going up, putting the moon up in the, in the heavens. And this is the, the raven coming down with the copper, which represents the wealth of the region, the big bear. And this is the little cub down here, which is the little, uh, the child. The architect is a little beaver here, tail. Uh, this is Indian paintbrush, which is Wyoming State flower. Uh, and then uh, fireweed, and these are all the, all the basket patterns. We can go back. We can go to the pole now. <coughs> and then let's go to the other. See, let's see the other one. See that one. Uh, which of oh, that keep one? Going. No, keep going. Yeah, there. And then you can see the colors of it. And there's this shows the stars up here and the copper. So I mixed. I used copper here, cast bronze, stars. And, uh, and then all the paints that we use, we use two different types of paint. We use a solid paint for the, for the, let's go back to the pole. There. So these solids are like the reds, but then in the, in the, in these, uh, in the eye sockets, I use a patina of copper, but we use uh, oil basically. You put it on and you rub it off, but it just patinas the wood and lets the wood show through. I prefer that. And so that's kind of the approach we had to that. Now, totem poles. You know, what, what's Steinbrook's pole is no different. It's, it's a public pole. I brought a few here. So we can get this little bit in some kind of perspective. And so I got these. I collect little artifacts. And, and see, these are. These are totem poles, see? It, this one's, uh, again, what's his name? Uh, uh, Mavis. Mavis. This guy's a very famous uh, artist who makes these poles. We know his work. Tourist pole, see? Tourist pole, like that. This one here is from Alert Bay. Alert Bay, beautiful. And that's much more traditional in, 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 the, in composition. And so this is no different than that, just on a large scale. Because these, they, the natives carve these, the natives carve these a little bigger, and they ship them all over the world. And that's all they are. This you, you can buy this in a tourist shop, and you can buy one of these from Nathan Jackson, and then you can take it home with you. They're at Stanford. <laughs> They're at Berkeley, they're back east, they're all over the planet. Japan, so and so. 
So with Victor's, I mean, he was commissioned me to do a poll. It's his poll. He has to, yeah, he can put it anywhere he wants to put it. They ended up at the market. So there was, I don't know, there was some controversy about the name. I don't know where it's going. But this, that, but, so I want you to understand that this is no different than that, see? Larger scale. Next slide. And this shows you some of the elaborate thing. You know how I do my poll. And this, I did this, per, I cut this, the red, here they see the red flickers of the ravens, because uh, he come, he he brought us the sun. And so the sunlight is hitting his wing, his ears, his feathers. But as you walk this way around the pole, they disappear. So when you walk the other way, then they come alive. Yeah, a little trick. And then, and then oh, poles can be columns like this. I may, I, we, we uh, laminated this column, we carved this, Eagle and Bearing Wealth, and this is at uh, done a lot of commercial public buildings. Uh, North Seattle Community College. Yeah. It was in the athletic department and in there, and then the president put it in his office, darn him. <laughs> you like it so much. <laughs> but it's a public post, and you can go in there and you can see it. Going to the city. Next slide. And I do a lot of models. This ended up in uh, New York. It's a private. Raven in the sun. Next. This one's uh, cast bronze, jade. You see I'm still doing the same thing. Come down this way. And, it may, and that's not jade, but I like the color of the green and then uh, patina that. Another pole. Well, not really. No. <laughs> this is the largest, one of the largest bronze castings in Italy. This is your sis sister city. You don't you realize well, this is Perugia. So you're you very much are part of this pole. It's again, it's an orca with the, a sailor thunderbird bringing us light. The salmon are from our region here, jumping out of the water, feeding us. And this is one of the terracotta. This is their mask and I have a face, and I put it on the other side. But this is an inter interesting story I wanted to share with you. That how how passionate the Perugian Italian people are of Seattle, and with meeting me, that they commissioned me to do this as the gateway to the city. So you go around it, and there's Chief Seattle's phrases about the earth and the sky and all this. And I go, oh my God, you want me to do a piece for the city, and it's the it's the entry to the city. It wasn't intended to be the entrance to the city. It was going to be in a roundabout, but this big burly guy, the only speaking, all the time knowing was we had uh, Danielle who would to interpret the, the, uh, what they were saying. He was yelling and screaming and pounding the, 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 and I go, he's mad. What's he mad about? He goes, and I go, man, it's got to be something bad. He goes, well, it's not really too bad. He's very upset about placing that in, in a roundabout, and I go, what? He wants it down here so everybody can enjoy it as their gateway to the city. And, and I go, really? He goes, yes, too much of an important figure. The other thing about this is unique is that I'm the only uh, non-Italian to ever be commissioned a piece of art for that city in two, over 2,000 years. And I, I questioned that because I go, well, why, why me? He says, you know, we consider ours, we're the true Tuscans, we're, we're, we're the real Italian, we're the true Italians here. We went through the Trail of Tears. We understand Native peoples. We went through that plight, I go, and that plight was, they fought the Romans, the Romans wanted to, to assimilate them, and they wouldn't do it, they built the fortress up. And then the church came in, you know the church, the Catholic church, they came in and tried to assimilate them. They said, no, you're not gonna do it. And they fought for years. And they survived. He says, you know, Mark, we survived. And that's why we can, we can relate. And, and so that's kind of how this became the bear. And we're just going back for our 10th year anniversary. Uh, and you'll hear, but she's sharing with the city, and the city's part of it. But, but that's the, their totem in, uh, in Perugia. But if you ever go to, Perugia's north of Rome, so it's kind of like over to the east side up of Rome, but it's a beautiful, incredible town. 
uh, very traditional. And Assisi is right across. So if you go up here, you're going to look over the valley, and Assisi is right over there. And uh, you know, the very famous uh, St. Francis up on top, and you can go and, and see and go to Assisi. But man, commercial, you know, very commercial. It's different. Right. So if you go to a restaurant. Brush up on your talent, because it's all in Italian. There's no American menu, so they have to bring someone out of the back in the kitchen to help us read the menu that speaks some English. Because we're on the back. Next slide. And then this is another poll. Well, it's not a poll, but it's a power figure board, a, a wooden board. But this I blew in glass. I worked with some of the best in the world. Richard Roy, who worked with Dale Trivoli, Eric Wall, these guys worked with Lino. And they, they work with me. And we stood on scaffolding. And this is actually all blown glass. And I invented this technique in the sense that this is all powdered glass. There's Mount Rainier, baskets, ravens flying out. And we use steel templates to powder our designs and then pick and roll that up. And then the actual foreground, the reason I'm showing you this, this is from Schnaklami. And they have boards. We don't call it tonables, but this is called a spirit canoe ceremony, and this kind of reflects that shape. And that's at New York at the American Craft Museum, where we have this exhibit there. Next slide. And there's me. There he is. And that's the that's the fin, the dorsal fin for the pole that's come up from, from the fin. And this is a, the, the uh, lifting the lifting the poles that we did, and uh, it was a great time. Boy, we were really uh, nervous, but yeah. <laughs> and then, let's see. Next one? Yeah. That's a big one. Okay. Is it 40? 40 feet? Or all bigger? It's awfully big. It's hard to pull it back. Man, uh, this is, there's the raven coming down here. And I'm sorry, there's a little hawk. This is the little hawk. And there were, there were, the ravens, at the, let's see, do we have the top shots too? We see that? Uh, let's see, do we? Well, anyway, do we? Okay, okay. so that, that's, that, 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 well, so there's a little hawk down here. Here's the do big uh, orca and uh, the dorsal fin, and then there's a little guy that rides on the back of the orca, and he's a messenger. He's the one that can speak to the land creatures and sea, sea creatures. So he's, he always rides with the whale. And it may, if you don't find him on the whale, he's inside the dorsal fin. So I wanted to put him here. His arms come around here and there's the blow hole. And a lot of them are little fillers. So there's a little bird in here, another one down here. And then uh, there's the bear, ears. And then we come up to the top if we can. Yeah, well, it's a little bit it's like further ahead. Oh, yeah. And so here's the raven and the sun. Remember I did the raven and sun? But this is, and this is a northwest, a northern style pole, but I wanted to bring in and reflect the Puget Sound, Salish. So that is a spindle whirl. A what? A spindle whirl. A spindle whirl is, a, is a, an apparatus that's I think, I don't know, if you, can you go back Yeah, I can go back to that. See it? Just to the front. Yeah, there it is. So there's the spindle world, but this staff comes, this actually is in the city, of, uh, this is in the mayor's, mayor's office. God, they always collect our work and stick <laughs> So this is sticking out this way, and the women would, wait, would take wool and spin yarn from the, from, the, from the dog or the animal there, and spin yarn, and this is a spindle world. This is kind of spins as it rotates and collects the yarn. And there's, these are thunderbirds, which is a very common uh, element that we use. And I put a little abalone in here. So I wanted to take that and honor the women and those that have woven, and it's kind of our tool. So I wanted to put that up into the, uh, into the pole. And I think that's really what I, uh, was my intention. More close-ups, a little further in. Okay. Kind of down there. <laughs> I need a haircut. Too. <laughs> this, this, this. And and and. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. There you are. What? Yeah. 
Charlie? Yeah. Right? That's right. Oh, wow. And then... Uh, so this is a... This that, is a this is 2010. And there's the copper like I had in the other one. That re represents our wealth in the region, <coughs> the raven and the spindle world. Uh, th this is the figure that uh, symbolizes, our, it's a person, but it represents Seattle and its wealth, you know, the copper. Mm -hmm. And then down here is you've got the whale, the messenger, and the little hawk here. And uh, the big bear. Oh, we got this is another bird here, and and, and uh, this is a parent and the, and the child as they wrap it with this area there. Yeah. Do you want to say anything else about the top? Well, the the, the raven. No, not raven in the spring world. Yeah. There's a close up there. Yeah. yeah. Were you born a raven, or did you acquire that? No, you know, no, I, I acquired it, I guess. I'm a raven girl. You know, I'll tell you, I have to tell this. I'm throwing names out. But we're really real close to Anthony. I don't know, you know the name Alan Arkin? Alan Arkin. He's a very famous. He's family to us. We've been together for a long, long time since his son was on Northern Exposure. So we've, we've spent all this, and we did the Santa Fe show. In the art show, he lived in Luke Santa Cruz, so we spent many times together. So I invited him out to, to uh, uh, Bishop's Lodge for dinner, and he says, "Yeah, I'll come out." He would go everywhere with us, and, and I knew he was raving. He always said, "I'm raving." And so we did a broad raven, and so when he came to dinner, we put it on his plate before he showed up. <laughs> and then he goes, "My God!" I said, "Yeah, Alan." He says, "You take good care of him. He's a good home." I said, "Oh my God!" You know, so. But I'm an Indian giver. I have to take it back to the show. <laughs> so I said, "You got to be here at five o'clock tomorrow. Or pick it up because the show isn't over." Boy, at five o'clock, you can see Alan walking down there to pick his raven up, and he picks the raven up. He starts walking up, and someone yells at him, "Say you're stealing Marvin's raven!" He goes, "No, it's mine." You know, it's my raven. <laughs> but his son gave him the raven blanket, the Pendleton blanket. You know my blankets, the four blankets that I did, Pendleton. And then we were spending time with him, and he goes, he says, yeah, Marvin, I, I think about you every morning. And I go, what are you, what, really, huh? He goes, yeah, because I have my raven blanket on my bed every day. So <laughs> funny story. But he's raven, so we're both kind of ravens. But I'm just, ravens are the greatest bird. You know, I'm really close to, you know Tony Angel? I don't know Tony Angel. Come on, you know Tony yeah. He's the man about ravens. And I, they, he has a permit to raise ravens. And less perhaps. And he had a raven in a cage and we went over to his home. And he let the raven out and the raven went up about 2,000 feet and took off and he came right back down. And he went back into his cage. And he says, you know, Marvin, he says, that raven cannot be domesticized. He says, when he's ready to go, he goes. But in the meantime, he's going to be a real pest. Because they'll chase you around, go in your house, make a mess of everything. Chase you down in your car and want to get in. And then one day, you open him up, he goes up and he kind of gives you this thing, and he's off and he's on his own. But he, he raises ravens, but I, we, we're just attracted to ravens, I guess. You know, anyway. This is uh, from the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs during Restoration in 2000. Yes.
USS Lincoln that helped commandeer and protect that village years ago. And so in honoring of that, of the Navy, they did the Lincoln Pole. And so those are, those are memorial poles. <coughs> And uh, they, in, in memory of a person, can be carved. Not they say after the deceased, but it's not true. You can carve a memorial pole for anyone alive or who has passed away. It doesn't matter. And here's a, here's Lincoln. <laughs> and so we thought it'd be great to have. A, there they are. Right here. In honor of our of our uh, our market, you did spike it. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that helps a lot. Native to this area. 
All that abalone either comes from Monterey or they traded them. They went over to, to uh, China, went over to Asia, and they got abalone shells there or traded them. And they cut those, and that's what they use for inlay in the Northwest. The abalone we have is pink abalone. The abalone that you're looking at that they use for inlay is called green abalone. So that's all trade material. Yeah. Well, they answer it quick. This is your third question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's just, I've, I've wondered about that along with that, that dog that nobody seems to know where it is. Is how, uh, where they came up with the colors for those, for the totem poles. Before. Well, the colors, those are natural colors. Yeah. Uh, because the black is, is uh, comes from, from uh, you know, uh, just, it can be, it can, uh, uh, charcoal and mixed with a salmon egg medium, which is an oil. So they squish the salmon eggs, create an oil, linseed oil, mix that with the charcoal, and make a paint. They also, what Dwayne and I would do is that they also use gunpowder or graphite, and we would make take graphite powder, mix it in with the matte medium, and make paint out of that. Now that really brilliant blue that you see on the Bella 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 Coola mask, which is much more, it's a, it's a cobalt blue, and that comes from a blue, uh, 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 whitener. It comes from one that is called Ricketts Blue, and you throw that into your wash, and it, blue, and it whitens your clothes. Well, it's a blue tablet, so they would take the blue tablet, pulverize that, mix it in with a matte medium, and paint with it. And that's what the... Bella, Bella Coola, Bella Bella Coola, see that brilliant blue is, is another really cool trade paint. And then, but if you want to talk about other, uh, you know that in the uh, Chilkat blankets, that's all dyes, and that, that's the yellow, uh, or the, the blues come from the copper, kind of a copper oxide, and the yellows come from wolf moss and urine, they use the urine a lot, and they would boil it and, and soak it, and out, the, the uh, yarn and stuff come out yellow. And then the black would come from uh, 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 spruce wood. There's an element on spruce wood that could, they could uh, boil that and it turns black and they would could, uh, darken their, their uh, wool. And, uh, and then mountain gold wool is really accessible if you know where to look for it because they rubbed all their, they, that, all that wool comes off. And up in the Olympics, they got more Darn on Mount Gold, they don't have to do it. So all up there, it's all full of Mount Gold wool. So the, the weavers would go up and pull all that out. Well, there's a for me with uh, muskox, too. I'm sorry? Muskox is yes. another uh, source of, of that wool. Not not for the southern part. No, no, this is all the way up in. But way, way up, they would, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Another goat. Another goat. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing these extraordinary stories and experiences. It's just wonderful. Oh, it's You're here. We've waited for you for a long time. Yes, you have. But, but it was well worth the wait. Oh, okay. thanks. thanks. Um, I have a question, maybe a point of sensitivity, but of, of late, uh, local members of the Native community have challenged the authenticity of our, our some of our polls, including those at Steinberg Park especially the Lincoln-style farmer's pole, and even gone so far as suggesting they be taken down and replaced with something more representative of the Coast Salish. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are. We have probably 40 or 50 poles around the city. And oh, there's places. no, there's no uh, argument. One of them is probably, you yeah. know. I, I don't, there's no validity to that. Well, I'm curious if you care to comment on, I, I, on that. Yeah, but, but, but poles yeah. are, are traded, and they're, yeah. they're placed everywhere in the world. I place mine. Yeah. Does mine belong in Japan? Yeah. <laughs> or does, does it belong in the, it doesn't, Tetons. Not, the Tetons? Yeah. Hey, Seattle's a mecca for totem poles. We got them at the Burke. We got them up, the, uh, up at the cut. We got their, they uh, at down at Pioneer Square. So he, or, he or she doesn't understand native culture of this region, or they wouldn't bring that question up. Yeah. What do you mean? Link of poles, look at that. I mean. But they, they weren't they, commissioned to represent Seattle. See, these are. They were commissioned by Victor. Victor to enhance Seattle 
from a culture that is so enriching our Northwest. We're not excluded from our, uh, our neighbors from Canada and Alaska. All this territory was one. And we have to realize that whole encompassing, we've traded a lot between Alaska, the Russians, Canada, you name it all the way down and vice versa, and the Asian community for centuries. And uh, this is just one means of, it, of, of bringing in and, and acknowledging that rich culture from the North, sharing it with Seattle. And we share a lot here. I mean, what do you want to be? You want to be, you know, uh, just, you know, yeah, you know, just come, <laughs> open up. And that's what we're doing today on these other things. I mean, this world needs that. Especially today. Yeah, look at the hammer and man. I mean, I mean where did that from? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? And there's four of those. Mm -hmm. You know. So this is a unique poem. And of course the yeah. You have something to say, Sam? <laughs> yeah, Fane does. Well, I mean it is worth Created, and they were actually built, as I understand, by some of the tribes over in British Columbia, and then traded, as you say, the tribes. This is pre-settlement, uh, you know, to, to the tribes down here, clearing the Columbia River, and you know. So the, it isn't something that really is a phenomenon that first started with the arrival of European uh, settlers. It was something that predated that. So it's something that, as I understand, that's right. Well, you're right. It predated the European yeah. settlement because mm -hmm. the canoes were carved up north and then shipped and could, and bartered down south because they could carve better canoes up north because they had better materials. The wood was better, strong, and that's where a lot of it came from in the different styles. Uh, the other thing about canoes is that we've measured the canoes and we have documentation of the one 36 foot canoe that I did and the, the, the beam on that and the length of that compared to one that's a thousand miles up they measured it, and it's within a half an inch. I mean, they've been doing these canoes for thousands, thousands of times. You think that they would kind of dial it in a little bit, because these are ocean-going canoes, man. You know. But again, things right about you know that exchange. It was a common thing. So I don't know where this goes. Yes. Um, the the uh, memorial poles are very striking with the with the fact that they're so that 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 the, the all of the representations at the very top um, for the Lincoln Pole in front of, is that is there a significance to that? The fact that, it, <coughs> that it's that there's no carving between the very top and the bottom? Yeah, because they're 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 focusing, they wanna they, they're enhancing that that particular if it's a if it's your if it, if you're a raven and it's a it's a memorial pole, not a mortuary, that raven will be carved and put up the highest log you can afford would be at the top. Because we're honoring that particular family crest, nothing else. And at the bottom, you might be bare, and then that would be the one that holds up the pole. So there might be two figures on there. And but the, but you're right. So that the honoring the the the, the, the farmers, you would certainly place them up as high as you could. You know. But uh, that's a good question about. The elaborate poles that you see that are carved, there's may, may, there might be two or three different stories. Um, and the low man on the totem pole <laughs> is the most important figure on the pole at times. And you wonder why they would say, well, why is the low man on the totem pole? But that one at the bottom is that figure that is strong, heavy. You wouldn't put a little bird down there and then have everybody stack on. So it's a matter of composition, artistic composition, is how these figures interlace through the pole. And that's, that, that you see, so that bottom figure could be equally as important as the top figure. Or the stories might go from the top, the middle, the bottom, the, the midsection, and back and forth, depending on, on the story and the composition of the figures. And that's the way I approach different poles, is that you want to fill them in in different ways and having different shapes and forms that work well together. 
You would have to know the person that carved the pole. The family to the, know what the story is on that pole. Well, like when you carve the pole, the, the you know, it's the artist really is is a, it's not he's not important in a sense that he he he's commissioned he's doing his labor and he's good at it. So I'm a chief and I'm going to go to you and I'm saying, I want, would you please carve me a pole, you, you get paid, whatever. I want to raid an eagle, blah, blah, blah. So I commissioned him, but it's my pole. It's got my name on it. I'm, I'm going to be given, I'm paying for this. So I find the best artist I can afford, but that's just, you're, you're just labor. And then you, you're good at it. So I carve it. And then before I can do that, remember, I have to pot that set pole. So I have to accumulate a lot of wealth. If it's a really important pool, then I have to invite all of those neighboring chiefs. In, in Alaska, you've got the chief of the village and the chief of the houses, depending on who he's going to invite. So they could be tens of thousands of dollars in blankets or, or material uh, property. I own the rights to that property over here with all that river going through it. I'm giving you that. I have because I can't afford it now. That's my property. Now it's your property. Names are important. But when the pole goes up, I tell that story. And once that story is told, it's only told once. You know, because there's no need to say it again. But it's oral history. So they, you know, it gets kind of hashed around a bit. But that story is told once and it's done. And the potlight's over. Now fighting with the I mean, the, the deal about and that's different about fighting the property. But now I invited you and I gave you 10,000 blankets or something. And you accept my gift and you say, that's good. You know, I, I accept your gift. You're a big chief. So 10 years from now, you're going to throw a party, you're throwing your own pole, and you're going to say, well, you've got to invite Marvin because he's, he's a chief that just gave us up. So when I come to your party, You've got to equal, you've got a one and a half to two times that value. So my investment is in you. You have to accept that. But you have to make it good that time around. I accept something that is at least one and a half to double that value in my investment. Now, uh, the, you know, the Canadian government banned uh, potlatching because of that idea of wealth and being the, the way that the, you know, you, you're giving it away and Christmas, you know, you know it, it's kind of a religious thing you're getting into this years. whole thing. Yeah. Huh? They banned it here in Seattle too. Did they ban Paul Lachey? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that the... Uh, I don't know about Seattle, but Canada, with it, so they went underground and did it. Yeah. You know, but before that, you had a rival cheese that you got to fight with. You didn't want to kill them, but you could fight it with property. So you could destroy this property, and that includes those shields, those are copper, copper, uh, coppers shaped. You could break a copper in front of it, you have to destroy equally, if not more, property. So it's called fighting the property and burning it with a rival chief. And that, that was devastating. That probably brought a lot of the Canadians into that to ban banning wars with property, destroying all that property. So does that mean um, it's, you said it's Victor's pole, and so he commissioned you. Does that mean that the story on the pole, did, is, is it your story or Victor's You know, I didn't really, we didn't make up a story per se. We just added different figures that I felt that was comp in a composition that worked well, uh -huh. you know, in that intention. <laughs> Pretty much that way, but no, we didn't have a story to really tell. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, um, so I'm working with uh, John Paul. John you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On the um, the native interpretive for yes. the uh, remodel for the park, and um, I've been tasked with creating the uh, interpretive plaques that are going on the poles. Yes. Um, and so, uh, is it possible for me to run the interpretive that I have past you sure. so that you can? Review it to make sure it's correct. Yep. Um, because most of the most of the interpretive I found was from the Office of Arts and Culture, and um, and they're they're verbatim. Like every place you look for the information, um, closes pretty much for 
verbatim with this like one one sentence description. And so from your presentation, I'd like to beef it up oh, yeah, and yeah. run it past yeah, yeah, yeah. you to make sure it's correct. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, love to. <laughs> oh, okay. Any other questions? We are. We can't express our gratitude enough for, for what you have shared with us. It, uh, it truly is marvelous to hear the history and to see the pictures. Oh, great! So, Terrific! And you know, you know, you know how to get a hold of me for her. You know how to get a hold of you. And, um, and for those that want to continue the discussion, have just a little bit more yes. work to do, and then, the, and then the meeting will be done, and the, con the discussion can continue. Thank you.